Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome. My name is Tracy Bleakley, and I'm Chief Executive of Hospice UK and also the Dying Matters campaign. Just before I begin, a few housekeeping points. You'll all be very used to this. Please make sure your microphones stay off throughout. We are recording this, so if you don't want your face to pop up on the recording, then please do turn your videos off. And as we're talking, we want to incorporate as many of your questions as possible. So please do pop any question you have in the chat box and hopefully we'll have time to talk about it a little later on. But first, I'm delighted to be joined by best-selling author Kate Moss. Not only is Kate the author of eight best-selling novels and short story collections, but she's also a champion of women's creativity. You can't have missed her over the last couple of days. She's the founder director of the Women's Prize. So she's been talking about that and it's been absolutely amazing this year. She also sits on the executive committee for Women of the World and she's a founder of the global campaign, Women in History, which was launched at the start of this year to honor and celebrate women's achievements throughout history worldwide. So welcome, Kate. Lovely to be here and lovely to see so many of you on this rather damp, afternoon. At least it's damp in Chichester. I don't know about everywhere else. <laughs> so the reason that we're here with Kate today is that she found herself in a position that so many of us will find ourselves in or are in. This creeping sudden realisation that we have become a carer, whether, whether or not we recognise it. But it's also a celebration, Kate's book, of love, of community and of family and of three absolutely amazing people. Her mother, her father, and her mother-in-law, Granny Rosie. And we think it's really important to share stories. Many of you who know about Dying Matters will know that our, our whole ethos is about talking about death and dying and sharing. And I just want to read a little bit from Kate's book, just a quote where she talks about sharing stories because she says, it's the shared stories we tell and retell that get us through the hard times the moments of light and fellow feeling that give us the courage to keep doing it all over again. So welcome, Kate. Um, you're going to start with an extract from your book. But first of all, I'd just like you to introduce the book to everybody mm -hmm. and tell us why you've written something so deeply personal. I will. Well, it's, um, that was a lovely introduction. Thank you so much, Tracy. I don't normally have my own book in the background. I'm normally... Um, interviewing other people and I have their book in the background but Tracy doesn't have a real copy so she said I've got to bring it and hold it up um, so here it is <laughs> an extra pair of hands um, it's a really good question because I'm not a confessional writer and I'm not somebody who does put uh, my own story on the page that's not really what I do as a novelist I, I make stuff up um, I do write non-fiction but I, I make stuff up you know and any of you who've read my novels which are either historical novels mostly inspired by France or Gothic fiction inspired by Sussex, um, you would very much hope that this was not my lived experience um, because it would be, um, you know, very, very, uh, well, a lot of the stuff that goes on is really, <laughs> really quite full on, obviously. But with um, an extra pair of hands, I was approached by the Wellcome Trust, who all of you, I'm sure, will know is this extraordinary uh, resource. It's a museum, it's a publishing company, it's a a library, all of these sorts of things. And um, it's, they asked me if I would consider writing about it, about the fact that I have been on and off for the past 12 years a carer. And, um, and I, I, it was really hard to decide whether to do it or not, because there are two things. Firstly, did I want to put all of that about myself on there? You know, I live quite a visible life professionally, but that is me as the professional person, not me as Kate, I suppose. But secondly, it's that question of almost of consent is how much would my parents have wanted to be on the page? Granny Rosie is here um, and I can ask Granny Rosie, but my parents, you know, they were very dignified people. They were a very certain sort of my, particularly my father was a really old fashioned English gentleman. Um, and so I had to think of all of those things. And I talked to my sisters and I said, I, I'm I am inclined to write it. And in the end, the reason I did it was the reason that we're all here, uh, which is there are 13 million of us unpaid carers in the UK. Um, it is a crisis at the moment in social care. Um, it has been a political football for a very, very long time. 
and it keeps being kicked down the road and we'll probably come on to you know what's happened in the last 24 hours 48 hours but even so it's not something that's ever seen and taken seriously and there's an army of people there are lots of men who care but the majority of people who are caring who are giving up their jobs in order to care are women and a lot of people said to me oh well you don't look like a carer and i said we are every type of person and we are hidden in plain sight and so then i started to think okay well it's it's fine you have to stand up and be counted you have to raise your voice too as part of the dialogues we're having and i suppose also um and you'll see any of you who buy the book or read the book or have borrowed the book from the library I loved my parents very deeply and I miss them very deeply. And I love Granny Rosie. She's a complete hoot. And anyone who lives locally in Chichester will probably have heard of her because she, she's a bit of a local legend, Granny Rosie. She's my mother-in-law, not my granny, but everybody calls her Granny Rosie. Um, and I just thought, well, you know, this is what, it, what is caring. For me, it's a story of love. And I felt that that was worth putting out there without in any way saying, it's a very tough gig and without in any way uh, not understanding that many people have incredibly challenging caring experiences but I was never caring for somebody with dementia and I was always caring for somebody um, who had cared for me first so I was repaying that I suppose so in the end I thought okay I'll do it <laughs> yeah. so Kate would you like to read us a section now from the book yeah, I'm only going to read it a tiny bit because um, I just feel, you know, it's quite hard to listen to, to readings online. And um, I'm going to show you that. I don't know if you can see. That's my lovely, lovely parents on their honeymoon. They're so wonderful. Um, that was 1954. And I'll show you a picture of Granny Rosie. There's Granny Rosie in the 70s with her horse, just so you have a sense of um, the people that are in the book. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit from the beginning because it isn't a memoir, but it is about the person I was because of the way that I was brought up and the way that I was loved. Um, so I'm just going to read a little bit. Christmas, 1975. My sisters and I are sitting in the back of our car, our legs touching and the seat scratchy. Street lights flash by in quiet suburban towns, then we're out into the darkness of country roads in the South Downs. Sleepy after a long day, a visit to my mother's favourite cousin and his wife somewhere in Surrey. Sandwiches for the journey home. Edam cheese. Something I've never eaten before. I want to like it, but it doesn't taste of anything, and it's the texture of my swimming hat. It's winter, and we're wearing flared jeans and striped polar necks, itchy at the neck. Beige and mustard yellow, the colours of the 1970s. Lava lamp prints. Or maybe not. Memory is a fickle friend, and there were many such journeys to relatives at Christmas. But if the image is slightly blurred, I'm certain it's Boxing Day or thereabouts coming up for six o'clock. We're in our usual places. Me behind our mother on the passenger side, my middle sister perched and looking straight ahead, my youngest sister curled up behind our father, a folded coat against the window for a pillow. In the compartment beneath the handbrake, there's a packet of tissues and a metal tin of car sweets, Foxy's glacier mints and barley sugars, the brittle taste of day trips. I wipe the inside of the glass with my sleeve and asked if the radio can be turned on, and the relief. We're just in time for the tail end of the top 20 and the Christmas number one. In those days, before personalised playlists and 24-hour sound, the Radio 1 countdown on a Sunday night was a ritual. One of those things that made girls growing up in villages in Sussex feel connected to something bigger, beyond the realm of our lived experience. For the fifth week running, it's Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. I've seen the video on top of the pops, and as I listen, the picture that split screen dividing into boxes and dividing again and again, singing along under my breath to words I don't understand, yet relishing the sound of them, the spirit of them, the promise of them. And now I'm going to just skip a tiny bit because we get home and it's still Christmas. <laughs> I didn't then realize how exceptional this quiet, ordered childhood was, how ordinary and how precious. 
knowing that I was loved. And because of those very many years of being loved unconditionally and supported unconditionally, that what was required some 35 years later would be both possible and a privilege. There you go. <laughs> so what did happen all those years later? Can you <laughs> talk us through how you became such a, a large extended family under one roof? Well, Granny Rosie, it starts with Granny Rosie. We, um, I'm a, a cisestrian, as we call it from Chichester, you know, someone who's chai, as we say, born and bred. Um, and my husband, Greg, and I met at school when we were 15. Uh, we went away to different universities and lost touch and then met again years later on a train. And this is relevant because it means that we live a very local life and all of our family is here. My sisters live nearby. My parents were in a different village. Greg's mother was nearby. My brother-in-law currently lives with us. So does my niece. So we are in that sort of household anyway. But we were living and working in London. And then I was asked to come back to be the executive director of the Festival Theatre in Chichester. And it was our chance to move home, which is how we felt about it. And I said very casually to Granny Rosie, uh, you know, if at any moment you fancy coming uh, to live with us, that would be wonderful. And <laughs> Granny Rosie sort of came out the week later and said, absolutely, great. I'm, I'm moving in. And so we were like, oh, okay, I wasn't expecting you quite that soon. Um, but that was 26 years ago. So Granny Rosie was our extra pair of hands when our children were little and has lived with us for a long time. She's now in a wheelchair and I'm her full-time carer and she needs all of that, you know, daily support in all of the ways that people do. Um, but for very many years, she was that granny who did cartwheels in the garden and was always, you know, the very first time I met her when Greg and I were teenagers, she was riding along on her moped, sitting on top of a horse riding saddle on the moped in a vest and an indecently tiny pair of shorts with a horse riding hat <laughs> over her arm. Um, and she's that character. She's, you know, she's the most extraordinary character. So she had lived with us for a long time. Uh, so my children had always grown up pretty much with the sense of multi-generational living. Um, and then my wonderful father uh, lived for the last, you know, good 15 years of his life with Parkinson's. And he was fine. He was living well with Parkinson's. I'm an ambassador for Parkinson's UK. Um, but then as so often happens with these stories, and I expect everybody listening will have had this experience either for themselves or for somebody they care for. Um, he just caught a bug on a plane and somehow got off the plane and next we knew it, he was in intensive care. And this was back in 2004 and he survived, but it was as if the Parkinson's saw its chance. And he went overnight from being a very healthy 80 year old living with Parkinson's to being somebody who needed support. And as the years went by, there were other incidents, other uh, moments, and it became very clear that my heroic and wonderful mother was going to need full-time support from me um, if she was going to be able to carry on caring for my father at home. And we had always said, my mother and I, um, that my father would, if, if it was possible, uh, die at home in his own bed. It, it isn't always possible. And of course, people who have life-limiting illnesses and particularly cancers and things that have a particular schedule, um, that isn't uh, possible. And of course, this is why the hospice movement is so important. Um, I have never, from my direct family, had to use our local hospice, St Wilfrid's Hospice, but it's the most incredible place. Um, I have other people and friends who have gone there. Um, so I'm a huge supporter of the hospice movement. But we'd made a commitment to my father that he could be at home. Um, and with Parkinson's, there's, there's nothing to treat. Uh, but it was clear that it was not going to be possible um, if my mother didn't have 24-hour care. And so in 2009... Uh, they moved in with us and my father had a quite catastrophic fall um, about six months after that. And it meant therefore that we were in the situation that many of you will be in, uh, which is that you never sleep for more than one or two hours at a time. Um, and there is that kind of, uh, the, the absolute grief of caring for somebody that you adore who is dying, um, but there is no timetable to that. Um, and my father had a very strong Christian faith, so he was quite fed up because he didn't want to leave my ma, but he was ready for the next bit of his adventure. And he was like, why, <laughs> you know, he'd say to me, why is it taking so long, darling? I said, I don't know. Um, you know, so I was very lucky 
uh, in that uh, to have such an extraordinary person to look after and the, and the environment we were in. Um, but so that's how it worked. So it wasn't, I'm sure many people listening have exactly the same thing. I never thought today I'm a carer. My mother never thought today she was a carer of my father. They were equals in their marriage. But of course, what all of us are doing is caring. And I think we need to name that um, because it can change the sense of the relationship. It can turn it into something that fe feels, you know, sort of a, a client and a patient. And, you know, when you've been two equal people together and if you're caring for somebody with Alzheimer's or dementia or anything that is uh, a cognitive impairing, uh, declining illness, it is a very, 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 very different situation. Um, and people will have completely different experiences. But again, incredibly lucky. All of the people that I have been involved with caring for have been themselves up until the moment they're not here. I think there's a phrase in the book that will resonate with a lot of people. Um, you talk about how your parents for a while plateaued and you, you talk about their life in your home with your family and the routines that they got into and the things that they enjoyed. And then you talk about your father's fall, but you say it, it was the moment the world stumbled and fell. Huh. And I think people will recognize that, that often there is an event, whether it's an illness, whether it's a fall, a sudden loss of physical confidence, but also of mental confidence as well. And, and it really shakes the person up and your relationship with them as a carer changes overnight. Yes, yes, it does, because I think, um, one of the things that happens, everybody listening to this um, will have, I'm sure, been in the same situation, that it's not, it's often not the physical consequences of a fall or an illness that are so challenging. It's the emotional ones. It's the loss of confidence, it, particularly anyone who is listening, who is a carer for somebody with Parkinson's. Uh, there are so, you know, there are many things that can be controlled. The uh, medication, the research, everything is getting better and better about how people live with Parkinson's and live healthily for much, much longer and much more easily. But there, is, there are also a lot of side effects to the medication and a lot of particular uh, signs, not just the tremoring, but the freezing and the falling. And I think for many older people, Granny Rosie had a, a tumble a, a couple of days ago and she wasn't in any way hurt, but she was just frightened because you, it, it's what might have happened, the consequence of what might have been. And at that moment, I think um, your relationship changes. But the key thing for me has been um, always to listen, to try to listen, uh, to learn patience and that things take as long as they take. So is it quicker for me to go and get, uh, in, in the days when my lovely dad was here, go and get something for him, lay the paper out on the table, do it? Of course it is. But does that take away a level of independence and agency that he wants? Yes, it does. So it's very important to, to say, you know, if the person says, could you get me something that you can do it rather than taking over. And I, I'm somebody in my professional life and in general who rushes around all the time. <laughs> I'm always really busy. Um, you know, I'm quite, come on, let's get everything done. Um, and so I really had to learn, and particularly with Granny Rosie, who has always been so active and so energetic and so independent she hates being in a wheelchair she really hates it um, and this is not in any way making any comments about people who are in wheelchairs or that that you know that they you know you, you know you know what I mean by this but Rosie really hates it um, and so me thinking when she says I'll just go and get my coat thinking well if I get it we'll be out sooner that's not helpful because that's taking one more thing away from her and I think all of us will know that we spend most of our time as carers thinking how badly we're doing it. You know, you just feel useless most of the time. You often can't make it any better. When someone you love is dying, it's really distressing. When they say they feel awful, um, the temptation is to go, no, you don't, you know, wake up, you know, you, it's all gonna be great. But again, people have got to be allowed to feel absolutely rubbish. Mm. and not put a brave face on it at home <laughs> I mean sometimes you don't want someone who's moaning all the time obviously um, you know, nobody likes somebody moaning all the time um, but it's it, it's all of those things and I think all of us as carers we we learn by trial and error um, and but again it was it I'm in a very privileged position in that I have a lot of support and as I said at the beginning I loved 
my parents deeply and I love Granny Rosie deeply. So I have a lot of people I know when I was writing the book and also talking to them subsequently who are caring for people they don't even know very well. You know, mm -hmm. they're caring for their father's second wife, for example, or a cousin because there's nobody else or indeed a parent who never cared for them. Mm -hmm. You know, so there are many challenges in being a carer um, and, uh, you know, everybody will have a slightly different experience. And of course, your lovely father died and your relationship or your, your caring relationship with your mother changed from supporting her to support your father to supporting your mum to transition to widowhood. And she, she found quite a nice life for herself um, by all accounts. And <laughs> I, I, I love hearing about how her relationship with Granny Rosie changed and their lunches out. I thought that was lovely. They, you know, they, they would never in a different uh, circumstance have been friends. Not that they did, would, didn't like each other, but they were chalk and cheese, um, uh, you know, <laughs> and, but, Partly the reason we could care for my father was that it wasn't just me. It was Granny Rosie and indeed absolutely my husband as well. And Granny Rosie would go in every Monday morning to sit with my dad into their part of the house, which is actually the bit where I, I am now. Um, and Granny Rosie would sit with my dad and they would watch Bargain Hunt. This would be the thing. Um, and it would all be very nice and quiet. And Rosie remained and still it brings tears to her eyes because this is the sort of man my father was that whatever time my mother came back, he would immediately switch off the television to ask her how her morning had been, because it was her one time out on her own. And Rosie said, so they never discovered who won, ever discovered who won. And Rosie just thought this was amazing, that he would you know, be so much, so courteous to her. Um, and that was very lovely. And so it meant therefore that they, they had this relationship and then they started to be ladies who lunched. And the, the thing was that they both, thought the other one's driving was terrible. So there was always a lot of muttering about, oh, your mother, or oh, Rosie's driving. Whereas the truth is, both, both sets of driving were a bit ropey. Um, and then of course, those things went away. Uh, my mother, we, my sisters and I thought she might follow my father very quickly. They met when she was 19. They'd been together for a very long time. Um, but actually after the first couple of weeks, she clearly made a decision she was gonna have a go. And she did lots of new things. Um, some of the things that she, they'd done together, she did with me, like going to the local theater and all of these things, or my sisters, or, you know, they all had different relationships with them. But other things she did that she never would have done, like jo joining Granny Rosie's singing troupe, the old timers, um, you know, and my, my mother, three days before she died, was wearing a mini skirt, fishnet tight, she had a killer pair of legs. She was eight, you know, in her mid eighties, um, singing, whiskey, wine, and wild, wild women sitting on a 90-year-old's lap, um, you know, as part of the entertainment, the, the, the Granny Rosie's troupe, the old timers used to take around. Um, so she did a lot and had a lovely time, but I, she was lonely without him. Mm. Um, and I think it's, it doesn't matter how much we put around her, in the end, he wasn't there and he'd always been there. <laughs> Um, so I think she was extraordinary, the way that she lived uh, three years uh, in widowhood and then made a decision. I, I'm still remain convinced about this um, and I'm sure there's no science to this and everybody who works in um, hospice and dying matters campaign will probably be rolling their eyes at this. But I, the one thing I always felt about my mother, she was determined not to decline. She had seen what decline looked like and she did not want that for herself. And she really was with us one minute. She had COPD and she had a few health issues. Um, but I put all her Christmas cards in the post 2014. And then she had to go to hospital because she was having trouble breathing. And the ambulance people came to see how she was doing. And we were talking about end of life. And I had to then ring up all of her friends and say, I'm afraid Barbara's died. And, and people argued with me. They said, well, she can't have died. I saw her last week. We went out for lunch. I've just had a Christmas card this morning. And so it was devastating loss, completely different from all the time I had with my father, um, talking about dying with him. I was very close to my father. Um, I was very, very close to my mother too, but um, my mother was close to, you know, she, she was kind of very outward going and my father was quite quiet. Um, so all of those conversations that I'd had with my father, never had with my mother. 
but I have no doubt that's what she wanted. She wanted people to remember her as the person they'd seen when they last had lunch. Glamorous, made up, you know, waving from a distance as she approached them in the cafe, all of this sort of stuff. Um, and she, she I, I still think she made that happen. The only thing that I'm just so sad about is that she couldn't see the turnout for her funeral. She would have been just thrilled, you know, because there were lots of wonderful people there. And I told the vicar and my sisters told the vicar certain anecdotes. And my publisher, actually, my editor um, said, well, if anybody, I know anything about your mum, by now she'll be rearranging the chairs in heaven. <laughs> and when the vicar said that, he kind of put that out there, the whole congregation, you know, they were standing room only. Um, and that I thought was a wonderful thing. Um, but I feel that she, she got the death that she wanted. And of course, this is what we're partly here to talk about, about how a good death is part of a good life. And that having the courage to talk about dying, it is gonna happen to us all, <laughs> to all of us. You know, beggar man, pauper, king, you know, all, all of those cliches. Um, and having those conversations and it not being a subject that we can't talk about, um, I think is, is really, really super important. So I had two totally different losses and two totally different deaths. Can we just talk about you for a second? Because I know to a certain extent your mum's death came out of the blue, but you talk about for the preceding weeks that you had started to burn out. Yeah, that it's very tough. Your life was not as enjoyable. You talk about the, the sensation of drowning but not waving. Did you, do you think on some level you knew something was going to happen? Because I know your mum's death hit you particularly hard. It really did hit me hard. I mean, much, oddly, much harder than my father's death. Not because, obviously, I wasn't devastated to lose him. Uh, but his, his body was a burden to him. Um, he genuinely felt he was about to see his mother, who he loved very, very much. Um, the men who had died fought beside him in the war and died. Um, his brother, his father. Um, he, he had no lack. His faith was, was secure and had been for the whole of his life. And so we had wonderful conversations. So although it was a terrible loss when it finally happened, uh, there were, I've always hated the euphemisms, you know, passing on and all of these things. But for my dad, it was a passing on, you know, he, and his body had become so burdensome to him. Um, he, he wanted a release from it. He, he didn't want, as I said, to leave my mother, but he wanted a release from his body and he wanted to get on with the next bit. Whereas with my ma, I think you're, it's very interesting you say that, Tracy. I think that mm -hmm. she did have chronic COPD. Every winter, we were in and out of the hospital. Uh, you know, her, her lungs finally had, had enough. She had smoked embassy since the age of 14. <laughs> she was extremely glamorous and wonderful um, and brilliant. And she always pretended she didn't really smoke. She didn't really smoke much of the cigarette. She would, you know, burn the cigarette. But, you know, she, that, that was it. And... In the end, they clearly just had enough. But um, I, I could see her getting frailer. I could see her, you know, I'm, I'm not very big, but I, I realized suddenly my mum was really getting very, very small. And she wasn't really eating as much and all of those kind of telltale signs. And so whether that was her health or actually just, you know, I've given it a go and, I've just, you know, I, I will never quite be sure whether it, 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 you know, she loved her life, but I do think over that autumn, or maybe just the last four weeks, she was, um, you know, she, she certainly was much more frail than I'd ever seen her. And my sisters felt the same. Um, so it was a shock, but maybe in some conscious level we knew. And what was going on with you at that time? How was that affecting your life? What were the changes like? Well, I was supposed to, as usual, <laughs> supposed to be writing a novel. And as usual, it was late or about to be late. Um, but I, I, was, yeah, I was away the week before my mother died in South Africa researching and my heart wasn't in it. I love research. You know, it's the be not the best part of it. The best part of it when the book comes out and you start to meet readers and that's wonderful. Um, but I, I just didn't have quite the level of energy that I normally have. And um, I just was a bit, I didn't write for six months after my ma died. It, it took that away from me. I, I was so bereft. Um, 
And I still find it, it, it was very extraordinary. The book I was writing, of course, when she died, I was researching. I didn't really want anything to do with it. I just, you know, because I associated it with her, her dying. Um, so that, you know, that autumn, there was a great deal going on. I was extremely busy, but I didn't have my normal levels of, you know, adrenaline fueled <laughs> enthusiasm. Um, but I think this is a very important thing to say. I am incredibly lucky because I'm a writer. Where I'm talking to you now, this is, this is my office. Now, it is the most compatible job with being a carer that you could have. Now, many, many women have to give up work to be a carer. And that brings up all sorts of things about resources and about money and support and a community and ha you having an outside life. I, I didn't have, I've never had to give up anything in order to be a carer. And I am, that is a very, very unusual thing. My husband's also a writer. Um, and so it meant that it wasn't that I was struggling in the way that a lot of people are. I have a lot of friends who are carers who are having those terrible things that they're in a meeting and the phone goes and they know that they're going to have to go now. And a lot of people live like that and, you know, the, the alarm goes off and all of these things. But I sit right here um, and Granny Rosie is next door. And if something were to happen, which it's not going to, um, but if it did, then I'd be going just two minutes, guys. And then possibly coming back saying um, we've got to finish this call, but I'm here. So I think that I did keep working and I, I don't now know whether... It's so easy. You know, I'm a novelist. Of course, I look back and think that I always kind of knew that my ma was, we were somehow in a different stage. But that, if I was writing it as a novel, we would. <laughs> but, it, you know, real life isn't quite as neat, actually. Not as emotionally neat, and it's not as practically neat. <laughs> I get a sense that you were a bit cross with how we perceive bereavement after your mum died that there's this whole thing about once you've done it once it will be easier and mm -hmm. certainly I think lots of people had said that over the years and great novelists and everything else and because you had coped with your father's death and survived and then thrived were you surprised to be so flawed by your grief when your mum died yeah I would absolutely was i was really knocked out by it um i you know i say in the book um it, you know one of the reasons you asked me right at the beginning while i wrote the why i wrote the book i just realized that so many people had these experiences and wanted to share them but also the thing that i found um not heartbreaking but it did move me a great deal was that most of the journalists who were sent to interview me were quite young women and one of them, I won't say what newspaper, because she, you know, she was a very professional and wonderful, but uh, when she arrived, um, she kind of looked at me and then burst into tears. Um, and that was, it was like, oh. Um, and it turned out, you know, she was 28. And the day before her grandfather had been diagnosed with Parkinson's and her mother who had cared for, no, her, her father had been diagnosed with Parkinson's. And her mother had only a year ago stopped caring for her grandfather who had di been diagnosed and died with Parkinson's. And she was a young woman and she didn't know where to turn. And part of the reason for writing the book was that people could give it to the people who worry about carers. And there's a lot of younger people who worry about their mothers mostly and also their fathers being carers, that they worry that it's burning them out. So, um, but on the question of grief, yes, I was absolutely, I, I, thought, I, I thought I was really good at grief, you know, because I'd been prepared with my dad. We talked about dying a lot. Um, we'd had wonderful conversations. He was very peaceful um, and ready, uh, very ready. And so I thought, well, actually that's fine because it's all contained and it's, you know. Uh, but then when my mom suddenly, really was just suddenly, not here i went to the hospital and then i came back alone you know it, it was it was it was that quick now that is wonderful and and the hospital my mother loved being in the hospital she felt very safe there and she always you know the, the um <laughs> my publishers were lovely they said you can't go on about how you're wonderful your mother is when she's in the hospital everybody's going to be nauseated but that you think your parents are so great i said but when she was there she you know, by the time I would go in to visit her when she was feeling better, 
everybody in the ward would know her name. She would have found out everything about everybody's children and grandchildren and all of these things. You know, she, so she felt, uh, she felt very cared for in the hospital in a way that a lot of people, the lot, they very much don't want to go to the hospital. Um, and I think the thing that was very interesting as well is that I had, um, my mother had given my father, uh, my husband rather, um, her living will. Now, as many of you will know, this is not as straightforward as it sounds. Often people think that they've made a living will that is clear about their wishes, but then find themselves being challenged by the hospital or doctors at the point that you're needing it and saying, well, this isn't clear and that isn't clear. Um, in my local hospital, they were very, very supportive. And my mother had left saying, you know, if, if you're looking at this, darling, you will know that I'm in a position. Um, and she had never told me she'd done that but she'd given it to my husband because she knew that my sisters and I would find it very difficult. And she was very clear uh, that if being kept alive involved being on a machine, she didn't want it at all. She just did not want it. She wanted to leave as herself and she wanted dignity. Um, and there were other things in there which never came to pass, but whether, you know, if she had lost control of, bodily functions or couldn't feed herself, all of those things. She had, was absolutely clear of the things that she did not want to be kept alive for doing. And that, I would say, is an incredible gift for a family um, because you feel that you are respecting the person your mother is and respecting her wishes, that she has made a choice. Now, of course, it's not always that easy. People do change their minds and all of these things. Um, and we're a family that, you know, both my sisters live very close by and we, we were there together. But the, often in families, as many people will know, there are siblings who don't get on or one who always takes over or one who always pays and the other one who never bothers to come and all of these things. And so sometimes at that moment, if people, if there isn't any guidance, it can become awful when siblings don't agree. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's one of the things that I've become more um, thoughtful about uh, from my own experiences of really ha realizing how important it is, if possible, to have those conversations with loved ones so that you do know whether you are fulfilling, you know what they want, mm -hmm. you know. And what I've learned is doing a lot of publicity for this book and talking to people like Dr. Lucy Pollock, who's written a, a wonderful book, uh, which is, I, I always get the title wrong, but it's something like a book about aging for people who don't want to talk, a book about dying for people who don't want to talk mm -hmm. about it. Um, and she's a geriatric specialist. And she says, you know, some older people are desperate to talk about what they would like, but their children just won't let them. Mm -hmm. You know, when they say, you know, I'd like to talk about what I'd like to happen when I die. Um, they go, oh, don't be morbid, mum. But, you know, it's, Mm. It, it, those sorts of things and my own experience made me realize how very important that was to have a sense of where the line is in the sand you know some people will say whatever could be done to just keep me alive do it but I think mm. most people want to live as themselves and die as themselves if they can I think that chimes with a question from Michael Brennan from the audience and he's asking did you have an educational intent with this book so were you trying to share your life lessons to improve end of life care and the way that we talk about caring or, or was it a sense of honoring those three lovely people in your life? Well, it, it absolutely is a sense of honoring. Um, uh, you know, it, it's a story of love mine um, to, you know, it, the book is a tribute to three incredible people. And actually, you know, I, it made me realize I've spent a lot of time with older people. Um, I'm really, really lucky. And I asked my children because, of course, lots of people ask what my children thought about it. And we never even really thought about it. And my children said, well, we've always, because we grew up with grannies and granddads around all the time, we've always just done that thing, which is what my parents did, which is it's what you like that matters. It's utterly irrelevant how old you are. You know, I spent a lot of time, you know, Granny Rosie's friend Patrick comes up every Monday morning and they have a cup of coffee. They used to be in a singing troupe together. And quite often I will be listening to them going through the lonely goat herd, you know, yodeling in the kitchen. And Patrick is, is uh, registered blind. And he comes up on, on his own on the bus and they sit in the kitchen. Granny Rosie's nearly 91 in the wheelchair. I make them a cup of tea, but then leave them to it. So for me, and I think for, and for my children, I was really thrilled to hear this. It was that sense of why do we think that 
older people are less important. I mean, if somebody's, you know, what about all the things that older people have done for all of us? This is why, you know, I, I get very infuriated when the only time age is presented on the screen on television, it's as a problem. Well, what about, oh my God, the NHS is amazing. People are now routinely living longer and living healthier, healthier better lives for longer. It doesn't matter whether you're 90 or 19. Are you fun? Are you interesting? Have you, you know, got stuff to say? Are you happy? Um, you know, lots of people have challenges and there's no doubt the biggest challenge of aging is, you know, as Granny Rosie always puts it, you know, she, said, she always says, you know, I'm a doddering old fart, everything's falling to pieces. Um, but, you know, that's true of me too. You know, I mean, you know, obviously I'm not 90 yet and I fully hope that I lived that long. But obviously it makes a difference as your health declines and it's very hard for people as worlds shrink often if health declines. Um, but I, I didn't write it to be educational as such. It was more that I wanted people to think about old age as a positive thing, not a negative one. You know, always with exceptions, but as a routinely, let's go, this is great that we have an older population, not this is a problem. And I did also want to very much say, we need to talk about caring. We need to talk about who's doing it and how it's paid for, because I just feel that the sign of a good society is how you care for the people who need it most, not the people who need it least. You know, I, that call me idealistic, but I think that is it. And this also holds true, not just for older people, but for people with disabilities. You know, one of the things that's been, for me, fantastic about uh, Zoom and the pandemic, the odd good thing that came out of the pandemic, is the access to people who have disabilities or mobility issues or geography issues or simply couldn't get involved in events. I've been able to do book events all over the world from this desk and have people listening from all over the world who would never have been able to come to a live event. And I think that's really important. And I think we were all hopefully rightly shocked to discover that adults with uh, learning disabilities were not being given the vaccine at the same time as their friends who were you know, didn't have um, disabilities. So I think it's, it's that for me, it's just, let's judge everybody by who they are, not all the other bits and bobs. One of the things you say in the book is that there are lots of bits that you deliberately missed out. And that was a lot about the, the sort of day-to-day -day guilt and remorse and arguments, and that it, it wasn't all, you know, everyday lovely living together. And Caroline Levokes, uh, Levo from the audience has asked a question about the emotion of guilt. And did you feel a sense of guilt as a carer? And how did you deal with that? Yeah, thank you, Caroline. I think that's a really excellent question. I have not yet met a carer who doesn't feel guilty. Um, I think that everybody who is in a caring situation or has to make decisions about care feels guilty. People who find a home for a loved one feel guilty about that people who um, pay for somebody to go in rather than doing it themselves feel guilty about that people who move somebody into their home um, when they realize that maybe they don't want to move in feel guilty about that um, and so i think there there is there is never a good answer there is only the solution that best suits you and the person you're caring for and your family circumstances Again, I, I'm, I'm, I have space. You know, I, I live in an Edwardian house, Therefore, which, and I say this because it matters, because the doorways are big enough for a wheelchair. I don't live in a flat. Granny Rosie, therefore, is mobile on the ground floor of this house because she can get through the doorways on her own. So things like that make an enormous amount of difference. So lots of, you know, really everybody feels guilty. And I would feel guilty about being impatient. Um, I would feel guilty about that moment that every carer will know, which is, oh my God, this, this same conversation about medication or the same thing that has happened. And you, then afterwards you just feel, just be better at that. You know, don't get, oh God, you know, is it, you know, you know all of those things, everybody listening will have had these experiences. Um, and I think that a lot of people I talk to, I mean, this is my story. But I did, of course, talk to a lot of carers, had the thing which I know almost everybody feels when you have been nursing someone who is very ill, 
uh, particularly if they have Alzheimer's or dementia of any description, um, particularly if they have issues that involve incontinence or a lot of bodily issue problems, almost every carer, when the person dies, feels a moment of relief. And everybody feels guilty about that. And nobody should feel guilty about that because we're allowed to have our own emotions too. And that moment of relief is there just before the truck hits you. But it's also okay to be relieved for somebody if they are released from their suffering because that is often what most many of us are doing. We are spending time with somebody who is suffering a great deal. Um, and of course we want to put that right. So I think guilt is a really unhelpful emotion. Um, and I try, whenever I knew that I was feeling that, I would try and make it something else, you know, try and turn it away from that. Think, well, okay, do something. Don't sit there thinking, God, I feel so guilty about this. Um, and of course you can imagine for my sisters, we had to have really big conversations because they felt guilty that I was doing it, but I wasn't doing it all. They were coming and going. It's just that we had the space. Um, so I think a lot isn't talked about, you know, guilt between siblings. I think a lot of people feel guilty that they can see one daughter usually or daughter-in-law doing all the work and the other people are not doing because they don't live nearby. Um, but my advice, Caroline, is, I mean, I don't know what your situation is, of course, but guilt doesn't ever make anything better. It never makes anything better. So trying to turn it into something else, um, a conversation that needs to be had or doing something is, is usually the best way to get rid of it, if, if at all possible. I think on a related point, Liz has made a lovely point about writing down your wishes about death and dying. But how do we encourage more people to do that? Because so few people do it. How do we talk about the benefits of people knowing what someone's wishes are and going through some of those you know, problem solving together as a family about who will do what? Well, you're doing it, Tracy. That's what you're doing. It's incredibly important. People didn't used to have these conversations because, you know, we all feel we're living in the end times at the moment, you know, in a very ugly world with a lot of horrible things happening, uh, lack of empathy, lack of tolerance. Uh, you know, my father would say lack of Christian values, um, which for him were about gentleness and turning the other cheek and reaching out, not, not you know, <laughs> the opposite. Um, and I think, but, the other side was that people's life expectancies have grown and grown and grown and grown. So people do need to have conversations in the way that they didn't have to do it so much in the past, because actually people died a lot younger, never quite got there, if you like, um, in that same thing. And also, you know, we forget quite a lot of people have, um, you know, an awful lot of people died in accidents, you know, particularly rural accidents or factory accidents, all of these things. So we are in an extraordinary situation that the consequence of the NHS and the fact that people with disabilities, people with life limiting illnesses should and are living completely within society, uh, you know, and living their lives in the same way that anybody's living a life. It does come with the consequence at the other end that we might find ourselves making decisions for other people in the way that we might never have done before. So I think your campaign dying matters is really, really important. And we just all need to be better at stopping the daftness about, oh, it's morbid to talk about dying. Um, because it's common sense, because it's going, I, I said it several times already, but it's gonna to happen to everybody. <laughs> you know, it really is going to have to happen to everybody. So I think, you know, Dr. Lucy Pollock, um, her book, you know, that I mentioned before, and I wish I had it to hand, because I would, no, I haven't got it to hand, but, um, it is a really wonderful book. I know I'm supposed to be promoting my own book, but I really recommend this book um, because she has lived her life in geriatric uh, care. And so she goes through in lots of ways about how you start those conversations. But, but her biggest point is always that mostly older people want to talk about these things. Not everybody, mm -hmm. but mostly older people want to talk about these things. And often it's their children that shut the conversation down. And, you know, particularly with... Uh, you know, a very complicated area, which is assisted dying, uh, which obviously is not, uh, you know, something that um, I've had any, any involvement or uh, even discussion about in any way whatsoever. But I've just read a book by the novelist Amy, Amy Bloom, um, and it comes out next year. And it's about her husband. And 
that was really, really interesting that he was diagnosed with Alzheimer's and he did not want, he did not want that. And so they did go to Dignitas. And one of the things I found most interesting in the book was one about how hard it was to be accepted for that, which I, mm. I actually found really reassuring. Um, but more significantly, how his children wouldn't, wouldn't discuss anything with him. Mm. They, they thought it was terrible and they, they said, oh, you know, you're miles away. You don't need to think about any of this sort of stuff. Um, and that was the, the message I got from Lucy, Dr. Pollock's book, which was allow people to speak for themselves. Don't speak for them. You know, we do this all the time with older people, with people with disabilities, with people of color, whatever. You know, often we all speak for other people when they don't want us to speak for them. You know, so learn to zip it and listen but also encourage the conversation. And I think the more we do events like this, the more books that are out there, the easier it is for families to start to have those conversations, but be guided by the person. I think that that's the, the number one piece of advice. And a lot of this goes down to something you've talked about today and in the book about the invisibility of old age. So I wonder, can you tell us a little bit about Granny Rosie and what her life is like at the moment? Because she sounds like an incredible character and hasn't she become a bit of a minor celebrity since this? She has well? absolutely become a celebrity. <laughs> um, this, she, she is absolutely wonderful. And she, she became a celebrity when it was um, the clap for carers. Um, when it was at the beginning, it felt like a wonderful thing as opposed to something that became a little bit um, hijacked. But, you know, we know, all know by whom and how. Um, but with Granny Rosie, she, she's brilliant on the electric piano. Uh, so she decided, as you saw all over the country, um, that once the clap for carers, for many people, it was their one moment of connection in the week. Um, again, particularly for older people, around here we live in an area where a lot of people have lived here a very long time. And many people are widowed and are on their own. They do have families, but you had to make the choice, you know, where, where you were going to be. So when people came out, they didn't want to just go back inside. You know, they, they kind of were now outside. So Granny Rosie decided one day she'd bring her electric piano out. Um, and she uh, started to play afterwards. We clapped for carers and then Granny Rosie started to play the tune she used to play um, in the, the old time as her entertainment group. And they were the old time music hall songs, you know, Bye Bye Blackwood and Wish Me Luck as You Wave Me Goodbye and all of these songs. And my daughter, of course, um, thought about that. And she just filmed it and put it on social media. And the next thing I knew, I was being run up by the BBC and ITV and wanting to feature Granny on television. And so, of course, they said, if it's not too much for her. Whereas Granny Rosie was like, everything. She did absolutely everything. And the highlight was when the book came out, was going on this morning on the BBC One and being interviewed by the lo lovely presenters. But Granny loves repair shop. I mean, it's her favorite <laughs> thing. And they got Will from Repair Shop to come on and say, hello, Granny Rosie, <laughs> it's really lovely. Uh, I've heard all about you. And when it, we finished the clips, we went, oh, isn't he dishy? I said, no, no, it's, the, it's the number one question asked, is Will married um, on the internet? Um, so she, she just loved it all and has reveled it in all. And everything in the book about Granny Rosie, I shared with her and asked her to read it and said, anything you don't want in the book, and she was all oh, anything, everything you want to put in the book. And there, so I made decisions to not put things in the book that I felt were too private, but she didn't feel this at all. Um, but it's, that, that's that been a wonderful thing. And I think, you know, she won um, at the Best of Sussex Awards a couple of years ago, the Local Hero Award. She uh, used to work at the school for uh, young people with severe mental and physical disabilities. Um, she knits for, the Snowdrop Trust and some, um, uh, for Chestnut Tree House, which is the children's hospice. Uh, she's raised over the pandemic more than a 1,500 pounds, I think it is now, for ch children with life limiting illnesses by knitting her little tiny knitted figures. Um, you know, she knits you know, somebody on a donkey or a Father Christmas or a choir girl or a choir boy. Um, and what we need is more people. There are, there are many Granny Rosies, people doing amazing things, but often the media only wants the gloom and doom stories. Are there gloom and doom stories? Yes. Are there amazing people just living their lives? Yes. So let's have more of everybody rather than just a tiny, tiny story which is being told. And Granny Rosie, she's quite disappointed it's all over now. 
um, you know, she's like, you know, are we going to do any more? And it comes out in paperback. I said, oh, I don't know. We did pretty much everything there is to do, Rosie. I'm sure there's a single program we haven't been on. Um, but that for me was a joy because she, I was lovely that she loved it so much. And everybody thought she was fantastic because she is and deserves that level of accolade, I think. Well, maybe we'll do one of these events with Granny Rosie and hear what she's got to say. I'm Absolutely. Sure that would be a very interesting She'd be hour. thrilled. Yeah. <laughs> We're in the last couple of minutes, but Dr. Max Watson's been asking a really important question, I think, and a good one to finish with, which is, how do we support carers? And you do talk in the book about how friends can melt away, how isolating it can be sometimes to be a carer. How do you think we can best support carers? That is a great question um, there, Max. And I think it is, it is at the heart of the book. It, again, another one of the reasons I wrote the book is that a lot of my friends um, would say to me afterwards, after reading the book, they're saying, I really had no idea. You do become a less good friend. Um, people don't understand. Um, they really don't understand that you are ringing them up just before um, you're supposed to meet for a drink and saying, I'm really sorry, but um, I, I can't come because something's happened. People kind of understand it if you're a parent when there's little children, but they don't really understand it when it's an older person or a person with disabilities that you care for on a regular basis because, of course, it goes on all the time. It's, you know, children grow up and it stops, but with somebody who is older and somebody who is dying, of course, it's a decline rather than an acceleration. Um, so that, I think, is, is really important, that we start to be more uh, sympathetic to carers, that we might be let, look like we're letting everybody down, but we're never letting the person down who relies on us. Um, and I think that is really important. Um, an odd consequence of the pandemic has been, I've been able to do a lot more because I started to not, I, you know, I do a lot of events, I interview a lot of people. I was starting to say no to things because I, I don't live in London and it's a five or six hour round trip. And it's just, it meant getting cover every time I did it. Whereas now, actually, it's been wonderful. I've been able to do that. So it's about understanding that the person who is caring has got a lot on their plate and doing lovely things like just popping around with a bag of sweets or a bunch of flowers, not always kind of asking for attention, as it were, but just being that friend um, that's, I haven't seen you for a while, hope everything's okay. Um, or saying, you know, if you, you're going out for a meal with somebody and it can't happen, saying, well, shall I come around to you and we'll have a cup of tea? And, you know, not being scared of illness and not being scared of, of people who are declining. Um, I think a lot of people, are not like all of us who do it, but a lot of people are terrified of physical imperfection. They're terrified of illness. They're terrified of older people, actually, sometimes, even if they're completely fit and healthy and, you know, living their best life sort of thing. And we just need to see more people out and about the media needs to be better at seeing at representing all of us um, and then I think people are less scared I think people are often quite they don't they're embarrassed they don't know what to say don't know how to behave they don't know how to talk and my father I'll, you know I'll leave with one um, my father was very clever about doing this and I think we as carers can do this as well as people who are cared for uh, we were in our local pub when it was getting quite close to the time when my father didn't want to go out in public anymore and he was going to have a glass of red wine and he asked the bar staff to put it in two tumblers for him. Um, and then he held out his hand and he said, because can you see? And I realized at that moment that they had noticed, you know, he, they could see that there was a physical problem. He was in a wheelchair, but they didn't know what it was. So it embarrassed them. But by talking about all of these things, we take away the embarrassment. People should not be made to feel ashamed of a condition that they're living with at all you know we and so the more that we all just engage completely you know and if you're talking to someone in a wheelchair get down at the same level no don't stand up there you know just shouting down at them um or whatever it's just that be, it's back to the same thing be guided by the person themselves and i think that if we do that carers um it's much easier for carers because they're not always slightly feeling awkward the big thing, of course, we need to do to care for carers is put up the carer's allowance. It is the lowest of all the statutory uh, benefits. It's disgraceful. 
Um, many people give up work to care and it should go up. It's a paltry £1.60, seven pence an hour. And that is because they know we will all step up. But we need to make our voices heard because some people don't need to claim the carer's allowance and other people, it's the only thing that they have to rely on. So that I think is really important. And that is a campaigning part for me of the book is, uh, you know, doing that and making, you know, this year's Carers Week, the theme was making caring visible and valued. And it means us not letting ourselves be made invisible, you know, owning the word saying I'm a carer. And then people go, oh, so am I. And then there's a lot of us. And then we've got a bigger voice and we need change. We need change in the care system. We do. We do still have a few more minutes. And there was a quote in the book that I just wanted to talk about, which was by Zora Neale Hurston. And I love this quote. Um, there are years that ask questions and there are years that answer. What's this year and how can we make it one of the years that answer? <laughs> well, it's a very interesting thing, this, because um, I feel that in very difficult times, we need women and men of the best quality who will step up to lead us through these. I personally do not feel we have had those people. Um, I feel that we need people who uh, are committed to public service and to putting the good you know, things for other people before themselves. And I do not think we have had that other either. And I have been very cross about the issue of social care not being addressed, having been an election promise for many, many years, all everywhere, ever since the Dilnock Commission in, in 2010, and then it was uh, commission reported in 2011, and then it was in the Queen's speech in 2015, and yet still. Now, of course, in the last 48 hours, there has been something, um, but <laughs> the something is, is not adequate, and it is also dishonest. And what I think at the moment is, however, that the year that we've had has meant that finally they have realized they have to start dealing with it. They're not dealing with it. It's, it's a bit of a moment of smoke and mirrors, but the mere fact there's anything is good. And so I now feel this is our time to keep saying, well, this money doesn't go to carers yet, it's going to the NHS. And actually with the national insurance raised to, to, to pay for this, some of the people with the lowest incomes are actually going to be funding the social care, which is the problem. This is not a plan for reforming social care, but the fact that it's happened at all shows that something has shifted in this extraordinary 18 months. So I think this has been an 18 months rather than the year that it's asked questions and it's up to all of us to make sure there's some answers. I think that's, that's all we can do. Keep raising our voices, you know, keep raising our voices. And I would say, because this is how I feel and this is what the book is about is, personally, I think raising our voices positively and with love and good stories is, is very important. Mm -hmm. um, because I think everybody is suffering at the moment. Everybody has suffered. Um, over the last 18 months. Many people listening will have lost somebody. Uh, my sister has, uh, was, has been very ill with COVID and has long COVID and, and, and will now be, you know, she won't get over the consequences of that. And we all know people who have died, um, but also we know people who have died of other things during this time and all of the, this. So the world feels not great, but it's still so important to just be positive about change. Um, I think because I think we're more likely to achieve things if we work together and saying, look, if you do this, this would be great rather than you're all terrible. You're not doing anything. You know, it's there's always a choice with campaigning, isn't there? You know how you do it. Um, and I think, you know, things that you you guys are doing is incredibly important. You know, talking about why it matters to talk about dying well and that dying well is part of living well. All of these things we're we're, we're doing it. It's just baby steps. We just need you know, each time a little bit more. Thank you so much, Kate. Well, that feels like a really good time to wrap up, to ask everybody for their next steps, which should be to go out to your local independent bookstore um, and please buy Kate's book. Do you want to hold it up again, Kate? Oh, always, always. An extra pair of pans. Um, I also have the Kindle copy, which is very helpful, and the Audible, um, the audio book is fantastic, and it's Kate reading her book herself, and you've all heard today how wonderfully she does that. So I can't recommend it enough. 
also please do get in touch with Dying Matters and, sh and share your stories. That is what's going to make such a difference. The more that we talk about death and dying, the more that we talk about caring, we can help more people and we can bring about change in everything we've talked about today. So a huge thank you to everybody who's turned up to listen to us. Um, thank you to all of those people who are going to be listening on record afterwards. Um, and a massive thank you to you, Kate. I know you've had an incredibly busy couple of days. It's so kind of you to make time for us. And I think that we've all found this um, really useful, but also um, a little hour of self-care as well. So thank, thank you. you. Good. Well, it's been a pleasure. And thank you for your amazing questions. I've read lots of them in the, um, in the chat box as well. And Tracy, thank you. And Charlie and everyone at um, Hospice UK and Dying Matters. It's um, such an important thing you're doing. And it's been a great, a great honour to, to come today. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs>